family, it's good to see you in the house of God this morning. If you would, give our worship team and media team just a big round of applause real quick. I mean, I, I think many times we forget how blessed we are with just incredibly talented and gifted and anointed worship team and media team, and they just do a great job leading us in worship. It is a good Sunday. This is Prophetic Presbytery Weekend, uh, which will be almost as good as last weekend when Toya preached the house down. So uh, it is going to be a great week. Give her a big round of applause as well. So I... I had like three or four people ask me if I was working on my resume last Monday, so I, so she can't preach again for another five, ten years or something like that, but um, it's good to be in the house of God. Uh, this is a very special weekend. Yesterday we had a prophetic workshop. Today is prophetic presbytery this morning, tonight, and tomorrow night. And we do prophetic presbytery every two years, and it's one of the things that in... In the life of this church, I believe, is a game changer. It was a mile marker for our church two years ago. I believe it's going to be a mile marker, not just for our church, but also for you this weekend. Um, yesterday, we had a prophetic workshop. Pastor Wayne just did an incredible job teaching on what a culture of prophetic church looks like, a prophetic family. And he does a lot of that in this book, which is a book I refer to a lot during uh, my messages on hearing the voice of God. And these books are available out front for 12 bucks. But if your birthday is coming over the next two weeks, raise your hand. Anybody? Boom. We take this back to her, somebody? Give her a big round of applause real quick. And it is a great resource. It'll help you kind of unpack and hear God's voice in a more distinct, clear way. And so after service, please check out that, that table and grab one of those books. If your Bible is turned to Judges chapter 6, I'm going to try to set the table for the entire weekend in the next just few moments. And then we're going to bring up one of our presbytery candidates um, and then introduce you to our, our presbyters as well. But Judges chapter 6. And so over the past month, month and a half, we've been walking through hearing the voice of God and talking about does God still speak? And obviously he does, but how does he speak? We unpack the many ways God speaks. We talk about trying to tune in to God's voice to hear him in a more distinct and clear way. And this weekend we're un unleashing the prophetic gift in this house uh, and into the lives of our people. And one of the things I think is important about the prophetic gift is the world fights through words. And so we've talked about this a few times, but the world fights through words. They use words to tear us down. And, and kind of my story growing up, I shared a story. I was born out of wedlock. My parents got married because they felt like they had to. And my mom told me a story a couple years ago about basically she was about to sell me when she was pregnant with me to a neighbor for 500 bucks. And so throughout my life, that kind of hung over me or mom would continually tear me down through words through comparison, through negativity, through emotions, through separation, through isolation, through all these things she would tear me down. And then uh, in another season here, the church in transition, it was a really difficult season for us. Toy was sick. I've shared that story many times. And it was a difficult season. I felt like I was in a, in a pit. I felt like I was surrounded. I felt like I was hopeless. I felt like I was defeated. And so many times the enemy uses his voice to bring anxiety and doubt and fear and worry into our lives. The enemy uses uh, other people to bring negativity, to bring pain, to bring emotional abuse, emotional trauma into our lives. But God uses people. He uses other people and the prophetic gift to bring life back into our lives. And so if the enemy can speak and bring damage, God can speak and bring restoration. And in Judges chapter 6, we see that. If you would, just stand to your feet. I'm just going to read a couple of verses uh, starting in verse 1, it says this, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and in the caves and strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. And they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents, and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted. So they laid to waste the land as they came in, and Israel was brought very low. And there are seasons where we're all brought low. Life just brings us to a low point in life. And Israel cried out for the help of the Lord. When the people, I'm going to skip down to verse 11. And now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abarazite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, Please, sir. 
If the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us or, or why has all this happened to me? And were all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Father, we thank you for your word, which is a prophetic gift to us and to your church. And Father, we just thank you for your voice this morning. And I just pray for just a flooding of your spirit and for your voice to be clear and distinct in the lives of every single one of your sons and daughters in this place, both online and in this room. And Father, I pray as the world has tried to bury us with words, words of emotional pain and trauma and comparison and defeat and hopelessness, that you'll uncover the gems in your people through dusting off those words with words of life and hope and joy and peace through the prophetic gift. And Father, we thank you, we bless you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So this story sticks out to me. Actually, this is the, the chapter I preached on my very first Sunday at chapel. And it just stands out to me because Gideon is this, this young man probably who is living at a time where he's at the lowest point of his life. He's literally hiding in caves. All the Israelites are hiding in caves from the enemy of the Midianites. They're brought low. There's no food. They're hungry. They're struggling. They feel defeated. They feel hopeless. They feel like no matter what they do, they just can't overcome this situation, this low point in life. And so many times in life, we get to a low point where we're struggling to find hope. We're struggling to find victory, much like Gideon. Gideon was at this place where he felt hopeless. He felt like he was surrounded in every single way by the enemy. No matter which way he looked, it looked like defeat. He was hungry. They couldn't even find sheep or bread. He was making his last little loaf of bread. He was hungry. He felt defeated. He felt hopeless. He was struggling. And for us, so many times, we get to these low points in life where we feel defeated. We feel like God has forsaken us and abandoned us, just like Gideon said. Gideon said, if this is you, then why have you not shown us what you showed to our forefathers? If, if you truly are God, why have you forsaken me? There's points in life where even God's people feel forsaken. There's points in our life where we feel like we're at the lowest point. And Gideon was hungry for something. He was obviously hungry for bread, but he was hungry for something to move him out of the pit. And that's when God showed up through this angel. I believe it was Jesus pre-incarnate, but he showed up. He doesn't speak to the, to the issues. He doesn't speak to the struggle. He doesn't speak to the defeat. He doesn't speak to the hopelessness. He looks at Gideon down in this pit in a wine press, hiding out for the Midianites, at the lowest point of his life, in a pit that it looked like he could not climb out of, and that's where God showed up. God will show up at the lowest points in your life. God will show up when it feels like you've buried yourself under every bad decision, every wrong decision, every broken relationship, every bad circumstance, every bad situation. You feel buried in a pit with no way to climb out, and that's when God shows up. See, as the world buries you, with negativity, as the world buries you with negative words, as the world buries you with your past and what you've done and where you failed and the mistakes you've made, God shows up and he begins to speak. And as he speaks, it's like a word, a shovel that just brings you out of the pit rather than keeping on digging in the pit. It's almost like as our kids were young, RJ was really into dinosaurs, and when these archaeologists discovered dinosaur bones, they have to unearth them. They have to dig them out. They're buried underneath years of soil, years of silt. And they'll intricately and intimately and specifically and delicately begin to dig out these fossils and dig out these bones and begin to clean them off so the world can see what their intended purpose was. In the same way, as the world buries us under the dirt of all the negativity, all the hopelessness, all the defeat, all the circumstances, the prophetic gift reaches into the pit and pulls us out and begins to dust off all the words of the enemy to bring to forth the life that God intended. He didn't speak to Gideon's past. He spoke to Gideon's future. He said, you mighty, valiant Warrior, you valiant man of God. He begins to speak, and he's not speaking to his current reality, for he's laying down in a pit. He's speaking to his future reality, because our God is not just a God of the past or the present, he's a God of the future. And he speaks to his present, current reality being his future reality. He didn't say, oh, Gideon, 
you miserable, helpless, hopeless soul. He said, you mighty man of God. See, even when you don't feel like it, God knows exactly who you are. And he didn't call him out first. He called him up first. See, God calls us up into our identity. Then he calls us out of the lies or the pit that we've found ourselves in. See, God always calls us up into who he's called us to be, saying, get it, this is not who I created you to be. I didn't create you to run and hide in caves. I didn't create you to run and hide in this pit. I didn't create you to make bread get in. I called you. I created you to be a mighty man of God. And that prophetic gift just drew Gideon right out of that pit. And then change the direction, not just of Gideon, but of all of Israel. Because just as a word can put you in a pit, a word can bring you out of the pit. My prayer is that there's Gideons all over this room. And our church will reach Gideons all over this city that have found themselves buried by the world. Buried by circumstances, buried by situations, buried by abuse, buried by church hurt. And that the prophetic gifting, that the fact that God still speaks and he speaks to call us up will call people back up, that our church will be a family that calls people up, doesn't call people out. And so there's four spheres that's in this uh, book that Pastor Wayne uh, has. He still speaks out front, but I've, I've shared this a couple times. I just want to walk through the culture of chapel when it comes to the prophetic. And right there, the first sphere is this. Sphere one is a prophecy of scripture. I mean, we believe the Bible is a prophetic book. This book is not a history book. It's alive and active, as it says in Hebrews. And when you engage with it, when you read it, not only do you read God's word, but it reads you and it prophesies to you to who you are and to who you are not. And that everyone, everyone can access the prophetic through God's word. Every believer. You right now have access to every prophetic word you need at the moment through God's word. And the function at chapel of the prophecy of scripture, of prophecy of scripture is this. We encourage you, we challenge you, we motivate you to have personal encounters with God through his word and through prayer every single day. Every single day, you should speak to your father and hear your father's voice. And you do that through reading his word and praying his word. The second sphere is this, though, the spirit of prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14, 39, it says, uh, so my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. This is an opportunity for all believers, that the Holy Spirit is in all of us, but he also manifests his presence and this is an opportunity for every single believer, but the function at chapel here is in our weekend experiences and our groups, where you're around other believers, and the spirit inside of you knows what the spirit inside of someone else needs. And that in worship encounters and worship moments, that the Holy Spirit can speak to you. Even when I'm not preaching, the Holy Spirit can be speaking to you during worship, be counseling with you and comforting you and building you up and encouraging you through an atmosphere where his spirit dwells and flourishes. But number three is the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. Some people are, are gifted. This is a, for a few, an opportunity for a few, or ministry for a few believers that have a gift of prophecy where it's mature to a level where they can activate and walk in the gifting of prophecy to build you up, to encourage you. We, we function here at chapel through that, through altar ministry and our seek nights. Our seek nights are opportunities for the prophetic to flow. Our altar ministry, when they pray for you, they're praying for God to give them a word for you because they're gifted in that area. But number four is this. Four is the office of prophet. That there's certain people with a prophetic gifting that, that overflows outside of the local church into the capital C church. And how we function in that here is through these prophetic presbytery moments. These prophetic presbytery moments to me are just beautiful. The first time I saw one was, I think, in 2019 or 2018. I was at Radiant Church in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And as I was there, they are having the prophetic presbytery, and I got to watch the prophetic gift be done in a way that I'd never seen before. I'd seen prophetic done in a, in a very abusive, unhealthy way. And here I am in this room, it's, it's Radiant Church, it's a kind of family gathering, presbytery moments. And as I'm watching the prophetic gift go forth, I was just in awe. And I told Pastor Lee afterwards, I felt like it was a family meeting where y'all had gathered as a family and God the Father just showed up and sat down and encouraged all the people who need to be encouraged. I said I almost felt like an outsider because I wasn't part of the family. I almost felt like I was, it was so intimate and so refreshing. I almost felt like I didn't belong there because I didn't know the people that were receiving the prophetic ministry. And I said, we have to have this at chapel. I have to find a way to have a healthy expression of the prophetic in a way that draws families together. And so when we had our first presbytery here, it was a game changer for us. 
I wept as I watched people I love and care about who I knew was going through seasons in the pit, seasons where they felt like they were buried under life, be pulled up out of it by prophetic words, by people who had no idea who they were or even what they were saying. It changed our church. It brought unity and power and faith into our church. And my prayer this weekend is that we have a family meeting where God the Father shows up and encourages every single person who needs to be pulled out of the pit of life.